now. It's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. Hello and welcome. He is Gary McNamara. I'm Eric Harley as we begin a Monday and continue the inflation propaganda. <laughs> Gary, <laughs> yeah. how are you? Good. Let's let, let's just start out with this because it gets getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. This is the uh, the president in uh, in Vietnam and a I guess what you would call a, a presser, a mm. press conference. So my my brother loves having these famous lines from movies that he always quotes. You know, and one, one of them is there's there's a movie about John Wayne. He's an Indian scout. And they're trying to get the, I think it was the Patsy War, one of the great tribes of America, back on the reservation. And he's standing with the Union, so he's in war arms, and they're on their horses and their saddles. And there's three or four Indians in headdresses, and the Union soldiers. The Union soldiers basically saying, the Indians, come with me, we'll take care of you, we'll everything will be good. And the Indian scout, the Indian looks at John Wayne and points to the Union so and says, he's a lion dog-faced pony soldier. Well, there's a lot of lion dog-faced pony soldiers out there about, about global warming. Uh, the Indian looks at John, he was leading up to the story in case you couldn't hear it. Great. Mm-hmm. The, the Indian looked at John Wayne and points to the Union soldier and says he's a lion dog-faced pony soldier. Well, there's a lot of lion dog-faced pony soldiers out there about global warming. Took the long way around to get there. Uh, he took the Pony Express <laughs> to deliver his point. <laughs> As always. And, and then this is something that I, I just, I've never seen this. Mm. I don't remember the last time this happened. Mm-hmm. This is where the staff cuts him off finally. Because he was rambling all over the place and not making any sense at all. Did you see the the the, the part where... He, I mean, it, it had to be a minute where it was like, well, I, I don't know where to go. I, I've, I've got my orders. And, well, uh, you know, I, I got to find out who to go. And then the press starts going. But he goes, no, 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 no. I've got five, you know, the, the orders that I've gotten. And it was like, my God, shut up. Well, I, and, then, and then this. Let me just play this okay. and then we'll, we'll have comment. All right. This is, this is finally when the staff said, we got to cut him off. And here it is. We talked about we talked about at the conference overall. We talked about stability. We talked about making sure that the third world, the uh, excuse me, third world, the uh, the the, uh, the southern hemisphere had access to change. It had access. We, it wasn't confrontational at all. We came up with thank, thank you, everybody. This ends thank, the count press thank conference. Thanks, everybody. He wasn't even done talking. It was like we got to get him out of here now. There were multiple people in that decision. And tell me how that wasn't an exit ramp that was built ahead of time. We're going to have to have a strategy when he does something like this. And if he gets into a one of these moments where he can't finish a sentence, cut him off and end it. Yep. Get on the debate stage with anybody. I don't care who the opponent is in 24. That's over a year from now. You expect him to get on the stage and be coherent? And here's the other one here about following orders, okay? Wow. Here's follow, here we go. Yeah. For, and uh, let's see. I'll just follow my orders here. Just follow my orders here is what he said in case you can't hear it because mm-hmm. the audio on these aren't that great. Here we go. Uh and now he's going, I mean, he's doing a Kareem Jean-Pierre. Yeah. He's going right. through, he's looking to see where do I go next. He just can't take a question. Uh, let's continue. Staff, is there anybody haven't spoken yet? Staff, is there anybody uh, that hasn't spoken yet? And then, then people start, you know, the, the press starts going, me, me, me. And he says, I ain't calling on you. I ain't calling on you. I'm calling on you. I said that five questions. 
There you go. Hate it. Be away. It's just bizarre, and he's completely lost uh, up there. I mean, it's an embarrassment. I don't, right? I mean, it's it's I such a major, and it's, and it's and it's scary too, knowing that our enemies look at him and say, "My God, he doesn't have a clue as to what's going on." Well, it, it, and all of our allies, yeah. How do you put trust in that guy? I have confidence that that. Few allies put trust in him after Afghanistan. I think I'm right about that, but I can't tell you for sure. Well, you saw the but, the head of CENTCOM that, yeah. that came out yeah. and what he said. Right. In fact, that's normally that's what we have to do to start the show. We have to go over everything that happened mm-hmm. last week. Mm-hmm. And that was the toughest thing yesterday going, wow. Where do you begin? Wait a minute. That happened? Did that happen a month ago? Oh, no, it happened five days ago. <laughs> We're going to have to take our vacations one day at a time. <laughs> I know. Too much uh, uh, Too much happens. But that was, I mean, that was really what came out last night. Uh, you know, really late, late, yesterday, late yesterday afternoon and, and last night was mm. all of this of the, the president in, mm. in Vietnam. And it's it's bad. And I will say, I will say this. There are, this past weekend, you know, there was a, there was an uptick of rhetoric from Democrats yeah, yeah. now scared about the, the president running two things. That and when I was back in New York, what's the and this is Western New York, what was the number one topic mm. that people were talking about without me asking them? I could hear it in other conversations. What was the only thing that they that I heard people leading with where for example i don't go up and say to them oh you're a talk show host uh, yeah i am uh, was so uh uh what do you think about this where i was asking the questions mm-hmm. it was just these these are people that didn't even know that i was there i mean i just overheard this and a couple of friends that i know got in got into it one knows i'm a talk show host the other does not uh the other might i'm not sure yeah they know they know i'm a talk show host but they really don't know what i do you know as as a talk show host. I I got that a few times. So what do you do? Sports? Mm. <laughs> I always like that one. Mm. <laughs> no, I'm basically Taylor Swift stuff. Mm, yeah. Uh, by the way, the worst thing that I heard, I, I didn't watch much football, but I did catch part of the pregame show. One of the jock looking guys on CBS yesterday talking about the Monday night football game. Mm. Well, you know something, uh, Aaron Rodgers really, uh, endeared himself to to the uh, uh, New York to the New York Jets fans when he went to the Taylor Swift concert in New York. That's the kind that's of that's how you win them over. That's the kind of critical <laughs> thinking sports analysis that is needed. It's like what? Well, and and he says she's really good, mm-hmm. and I'm like, wow, what is it? What what, what did I miss? <laughs> you know that's that's the problem. <laughs> if, if, if Tom Brady would have just found a Taylor Swift concert to go to in Tampa, maybe he would have gone out a winner. <laughs> what the hell, man? Seriously, I know. I just went wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, but uh, we uh, we've we've got a great show ahead because there's uh, there. So much uh, happened uh, uh, last week. We'll, we'll get into the New Mexico governor. By the way, I do think that the New Mexico governor uh, basically putting a hold or a temporary ban on the Second Amendment. I really think that what she said, I think it's a great thing for people to, and we'll go over it, to see what she said because it really encap- encapsulates liberalism completely well no we've been saying it for a long time it didn't surprise me at all it was like well no this is exactly how they think well but what she said the precise thing she said well this is really isn't going to this isn't going to stop criminals from doing anything but it will send a message yeah Uh, it'll make people aware of it well and 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 the fact that they don't believe in the constitution well yeah that that too but i mean we we know that, but the point I was trying to bring up is I should have explained it further uh, in more detail. The point I was bringing up is they 
they know that the things that they promote aren't going to work. Mm, mm -hmm. But they promote them anyway. Right. They know they're not going to work by what they said. And we'll go through what she actually said, where she said, well, this isn't going to stop criminals from using guns. Right. Well, who the hell else is using guns? Right. Well, no, in, I mean, in an illegal it's, way, except it's, criminals. It's uh, it, it's akin to when Obama was asked, my gosh, I have to go back 11 years on the debate stage about raising taxes. And Charlie Gibson, the moderator, was asking him about raising taxes. Well, the problem is when you raise taxes, Mr. Obama, that's shown that you drop that revenue to the government drops. Right. So if you actually care so, about yeah. doing things, so if you, if right. you actually want to do things with that money that's not the way to get the money well i know charlie but we'll do it out of a sense of fairness and that's exactly what i I was waiting for the new mexico governor to say we'll do it out of a sense of uh feeling better i'm i'm gonna wait for her to say that that. maybe i missed that in the comments maybe maybe she didn't say it that way uh she didn't say it that way but maybe she that's that's essentially the point she's making Oh, we'll do it so people will feel better. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to stop the criminals. They know this. They know all of this. They're counting on their constituents, the people that vote for them, to be stupid. There it is. The governor says she does not expect criminals to follow the order, but she hopes it is a, quote, a resounding message, end of quote. To who? To everyone else in the community to report gun crimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you see that the Albuquerque DA said, well, we're not going to enforce it. You had a sheriff say, we're not going to enforce it. You saw the rallies of people armed. Right. I mean, well, it's I you you sit there and you say, what is the purpose of her doing that? And we'll go through everything that she said, because it, it does Get you. Now, it's not going to make you understand the mind of a liberal. You're not going to say, oh, I understand her thought process. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember right. when when my my uncle Norm, uh, we had, dis- you know, disagreements. He was uh, probably a social conservative, but more of a fiscal liberal. Uh, as a lot of uh, uh, blue dog Democrats were at, at, at points mm-hmm. back then. Uh, and but he told me he said I disagree with you, but I always know how you get to your point. And when I realize how you get to your point, it does make sense to me. Mm-hmm. It does make me think. And that was a great compliment from my 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 late uncle when he said that. Mm-hmm. Uh, here you're going to read this. It's not going to make any sense. You're going to go, but there's no critical thinking or logic based here. And it's like, yeah, that's the point. It's almost as if there's just electronic pulses going through pe- these people's minds. And no critical thinking comes out of it, just emotional rants. Yeah. Yeah, it's all based on emotion. And so we'll uh, we'll get uh, to uh, to that. And, I'm, and I'm, I start thinking back. I'm like, whoa, what else is there to talk about? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I was doing on, on Wednesday night. Wednesday night was grid watch here in Texas mm-hmm. last Wednesday night. Yeah, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll get to. Uh, oh, yeah. And I, I did a screenshot of one of the uh, local television stations and, and how they wrote. Oh. It was, they said, there's a weather watch. Yeah. And I was like, weather watch? There's no expectation of rain. Now, over the weekend, they got rain, but this is last week, in the middle of the week. There is a weather watch. What are you talking weather watch? Their ERCOT is watching the temperatures. No, 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 no. Call that what it is. Insanity that we have to sit here and do this when we're an energy-producing state. We decide wind and solar is going to be what we lean mm-hmm. on, and you can't lean on it during the warmest or coldest of days. And I was reading an article, I think it was a National Review, about how some rental car companies are giving you electric vehicles, and some people don't know they're getting an electric vehicle until they right. get an electric vehicle. And they've never operated an electric vehicle. Right. Well, uh, I... Uh, when uh, I was on the plane, I checked my my uh, my uh, uh, rental, and uh, I'd made a mistake. I th- I thought I was coming. I had put that I was coming in at ten a.m. Mm-hmm. Well, that's when I was leaving. <laughs> that's when mm-hmm. I was getting to the airport. Mm-hmm. But I didn't pick it up till five thirty. But when I checked it, I had a hybrid. 
Mm. And when I got there, they didn't have any left. By the way, it's horrible with rental car companies right mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. If if you have like I'm fast break for budget or with the other one preferred, mm-hmm. it means absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. They're completely unprepared. Mm-hmm. They, this is like six months now of having to wait 40 minutes to get a car. And you're supposed to walk up, show your license, and go away. And it's a mess. It's a complete mess mm-hmm. at a lot of rental car companies at a lot of airports across the country. Mm-hmm. They can't find the workers. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's horrible yeah. right now. Yeah. You know, you're seeing people go, I thought I was just supposed to show my license and get out of here. And right. then then you sit there and you get your car, and there's a row of cars in front of you that they have to move. So you have to wait another 20 minutes. It's yeah. bad mm. right now. Mm. 866-90-RED-EYE. This preventative maintenance tip is brought to you by Hot Shot Secret, the country's number one fastest growing oil and additive company. If you've been driving a diesel any length of time, you know diesel fuel quality can be an issue. There are U.S. standards that diesel fuel is supposed to meet, like cetane number, lubricity, a.k.a. wear protection, deposit control. But oftentimes, the fuel at the pump falls short. Let's highlight diesel fuel's lubricity. Diesel fuel in the United States must have enough lubricity so the fuel does not produce a wear scar greater than 520 microns. Without the proper lubricity, Lubrication, you run the risk of fuel pump and injector failures. This is why a premium additive is needed to keep lubricity levels in spec, to keep the fuel system protected and avoid costly repairs and downtime. Add Hot Shot Secret Everyday Diesel Treatment, a 6-in-1 fuel booster at every fill-up to keep your fuel's lubricity within specification of U.S. standards and the Engine Manufacturers Association's recommendation for lubricity to keep your fuel system protected. Learn more about the science behind diesel fuel and Hot Shot Secret's Everyday Diesel Treatment at HotShotSecret.com. This report is brought to you by Shell Rotella. Shell Rotella, with advanced synthetic technology, is designed to help keep your rig running with more mileage and less maintenance. Get in touch with Red Eye Radio, toll free at 866-90-RED-EYE. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Harley, and I'm Gary McNamara. This <laughs> I just got to play this Education Secretary Cardona last week on CNN. Mm. This is just some of the things. I'm just going through all the stuff last week <laughs> that that we missed. Mm. This is a beautiful one. Here we go. Watch how quickly he tries to get through this. He doesn't want to answer the question. Here we go. Mr. Secretary, I do appreciate that. But who's paying for that cost? Well, as I said before, the deficit reduction uh, is creating space for uh, policies that open the door right. to access. But let me let me shift a bit I, to I just want the to students understand. that I spoke to yesterday. I do. I do. I want to hear from them. I want to. Big issue. I want to hear about that. But I also just want to sure. level with the American people. That cost is federal government pays for it. Taxpayers. Right. It's part of the uh, president's uh, plan, which also includes deficit reduction. You okay. can't doesn't include deficit reduction. The deficit's doubled. They're still using the same excuse as we know the deficit's now going to double from last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That argument's gone. And <laughs> what's paying for the new student loan debt bailout? Deficit reduction. Which what doesn't a, exist. No, it doesn't exist. And everything seems to be falling apart now. I mean, that's one thing that I did notice just generally catching, you know, not not because when you go on vacation, you're not doing the same research and using the same sources. A lot of what you hear is the mainstream media. That's what you hear if you're not out there searching for it and being on vacation. I don't search for it as much. And I take it as a great opportunity to say, okay, what's actually the buzz out there? And the buzz out there was the migrant situation is completely and totally out of control and nobody is buying Bidenomics at all. Giving you 70% each night. Eric Harley and Gary McNamara on Red Eye Radio. 
And That's a lot. Hey, he's Eric. I'm Gary. <laughs> so vacation good for you? Yeah, yeah it was we, really great, actually. Yeah, we haven't talked. By the way, people may think, oh, you guys already had this conversation. We didn't have this conversation off the air at all. No, <laughs> no. Vacation. No, no uh, <laughs> it was really great. Uh, uh, went down on the Gulf and did some fishing. It was uh, very successful. Caught, uh, I don't know how many different species out of the Gulf waters. A lot of it uh, we we put back. Uh, some of it we brought home. Some of it I cooked up that night. Was it, that would have been Friday night mm. uh, at the beach house, and uh, it was it, it was great because uh, the the uh, the the boat captain that that took us out on the charter, Captain Chris, told us that. And he's a local. So this is Galveston, Texas. And we're actually staying, uh, this would have been uh, west of Galveston. We're on another, we're off of Galveston Island where we stay and Brazoria County. But he was telling us on Galveston Island, it's great on, on Labor Day, like Monday afternoon, Labor Day afternoon. He said it just clears out. All the tourists go home and it's, you know, and you they the locals kind of have them the place to themselves, you know, and it gets back to being a, you know, more of a small town. Mm -hmm. And that was the case. I could say anecdotally, uh, just, you know, visiting a number of different places uh, in Galveston. It was, and we planned it this way. We didn't go until Wednesday. So, and then came back Saturday, uh, did our fishing on Friday. And it was, it was really good. The fishing was better than expected because the waters were so warm and normally, uh, we caught a couple of big redfish. You have to, the big ones outside of the slot limits, you have to have a, a tag for on your fishing license. And so I used my one tag. I did not get, for those that may want to ask, I did not get my bonus tag. And uh, so we may get a bonus tag and go back later or just get the slot fish, which is has to be between 20 and 28. Ours were much larger. And uh, so you have to have a tag for them and you have to, you know, and we went out. We got to our place, uh, left around uh, 5 till 7. You go basically, you leave the marina around 5 till sunup, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of cruise out. It takes us about 30 minutes to get to where we're going. We're about 7 miles, uh, almost 8 miles out. And the captain had marked this place for redfish. I mean, because they're so much fun to catch. And when we put the poles in, and it wasn't and I'm no exaggeration. It wasn't two minutes before they were hitting. And our second one came just a couple of minutes after that. So we got two in the boat and then just went around and basically played and, and, and fished for multiple species and, and had a great time. Um, hung out uh, with, uh, with a couple of family members and uh, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law came and, and really just did a lot of, you know, nothing. There was a lot going on. You were talking about show prep. A lot of my show prep, comes to me, you know, alerts that I've got set on different apps. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of stuff that was, you know, you know, coming my way during the day, which was fine. It was a bit of a slower vacation because I didn't have my grandkids with me. You know, I didn't have to, you know, plan every second of every day. We just hung out and did whatever. So it was uh, very good. It was very good. We got, we got back uh, Saturday afternoon and basically said goodbye to the 100-plus temperatures. I mean, oh, I know. They're gone, and <laughs> this week we're going to, you know, we're just going to kind of roll into fall when I woke here in up, North Texas. When I woke up uh, tonight to come into work, I just checked out the high today. supposed to be 89. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's 21 degrees cooler than Friday. <laughs> yeah, and maybe maybe a little rain this week. And, yeah. You know, it's... Yeah. it's uh, maybe a lot of rain. Yeah, it could be for yeah. some. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, it was good. How was yours? I uh, just, you know, uh, visited visited Dad, kept the ears open just because I was, you know, in New York and, and want to know what's going on in, the lib you know, in, in that liberal state. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I'm telling you, people just, I mean, it, this was the first time that I came back that I heard, like I said, unsolicited probably three or four times just being in different places going to different places, restaurants, whatever, and hearing people talking, they are livid about the migrant mm -hmm. situation. Right, yeah. Uh, uh, there, which, uh, again, I found was interesting. But uh, I did that. I was back Monday, and really the entire week, I only played golf once. Right. Got out real early on Wednesday morning. 
me, yeah. for me, yeah. 9 a.m. And, and, um, and was done by 1. It got up to, I don't know, 100, 506 that day. Right, right. Uh, but hit a lot of golf balls. And so I'm really looking forward to this fall season because yeah. then with my lessons and everything else, I'm just killing the ball. So it's going to be a lot of fun. But other than that, I, I, I did uh, the steam cleaning of three rooms of carpeting. Oh, that sounds exciting. So I have like yeah. two more left for my fall. Yeah. And two more left that I'll get done this week. And, you know, it takes to do the whole thing. You know, you take and I do everything. I do it once a year, every room. And this is cleaning the baseboards. Ah, yes. What it is to be a uh, nationally syndicated talk radio host mm. on Westwood One. What did you want to do on your vacation? Clean the baseboards and steam clean the carpeting. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I've got my own steam cleaner. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, but it takes a whole day to do it because you got to let the whole thing completely dry, mm. you know, for the next day. So that was really uh, that was really it, and just worked out a lot. I really didn't do much at all. I mean, it was uh, some would say I it for, from Monday on I was a hermit except yeah. for going out golfing well, and, and shopping, and I was. I mean, I just yeah. I, on Labor Day, we went to see my mom and dad and and hung out with them. All the talk, you know, it's it's Texas. And all the talk was about the heat and and, and the drought yeah. up there. Uh, they haven't had, and they have very strict uh, water restrictions. And you know, he. But it was interesting. My dad said, you know, even the local media in small town has changed. It's they're doing. They seem to be doing some of the stuff that the that the other media is doing. And I said, and I said, well, sometimes it can be. The fact that they're getting their stories maybe from AP, right? They're not, they don't have the, the staff that the other, you know, larger stations and larger markets may have. Um, and so he said, you know, it's just kind of disappointing. You don't know what to trust on the news. And I think that's been the case for a long, long time. You know, growing up, it was all always about watching the local news. Then you watch the national news. You watch the evening news. And they don't really, I mean, they watch the forecast. They do watch the local news, the national stuff. They don't even pay attention to anymore because, you know, dad's very savvy. He's on his laptop. He's on his smartphone. Uh, he gets a lot of stuff that comes across. He reads, he still gets the local paper delivered. And he says, I don't know why, you know, it's, you'll see some things in there, but it's not, it's not the same. And I think it's, you know, the fact that you, you, whether they don't have the people that want to go into that career field anymore. Cause those are, you know, if you think about it, those are the feeder markets. Those are the, you know, you go in, you get your experience in a smaller market. This town's only 120,000 people. And then they're going to go on to, you know, hopefully bigger and better things. That's the, uh, that's the idea. That's where I started radio. And, but it's not like it was back in the day because you get so much, that comes in from they have to rely these days more and more on AP or stories from whatever network they're affiliated with. Uh, the one that my parents watch is an NBC affiliate. So, you know, you're just going to get basically what's feeding. Not that they don't have reporters. It's just you're not going to find the same number of people wanting to get into that career field. And, those companies, those smaller media companies, are not spending. No, the way they're not. They used to. They're, they're not. They're they don't not pay spending, anything. Right? They don't pay anyone. So, you know, it's harder to attract anyone there. I, I saw, and this was uh, on social media, and it was on one of the broadcasting blogs. Talk, and I don't know what it was, but it was major market newspaper mm. looking for full time reporter, nineteen dollars an hour. Wow. Yeah. And that was a, it was just, and I I don't know, it was, you know, wow. uh, And I know for a fact that in a lot of the newspapers that are union, they're having non-union people, you know, as Mm. guest contributors that that, that are, that are doing it on a, a, on a consistent, on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. I will say this. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things, and I don't know, maybe it was, maybe it was because after I got back Monday, except for golfing, hitting golf balls, I was staying in the house just doing stuff, and maybe it was just me getting cranky. But I was one of the things when you, when you brought it up, I I thought to myself because I thought about it in the middle of 
like I don't. It was probably by the time we got to yesterday. I said, "Is everything hyped? Is everything hyped to the 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 point of almost parody?" I was looking at what was it uh, one of the, um, and it, and I, I think the conclusion of my of my analysis of being on vacation was uh, it was a promo for the Masked Singer, <laughs> and it was so contrived yeah right you know these people in the audience like oh it was almost like we're going back to the you know the jerry springer kind of thing uh, again Mm -hmm. but these Mm -hmm. people like absolutely in awe of what i'm like come on this is stupid yeah it's somebody in a mask singing it's not a big deal yeah like it's the most important thing ever and I don't know, maybe I'm just getting older, but the well, same thing. This... No, they're, they're actually, it is a contrived thing. It's a controlled thing, and they they coach the audiences, <laughs> and they also will go back and reshoot certain reactions. They'll they'll move certain yeah. people up front. Uh, they'll put certain people on camera in the audience, others not. They'll coach them. Um, America's Got Talent is really bad about it. And and so I was I was like, well, this is... The first reaction was, this is fake. I just don't watch a lot of, you know, TV like mm. that. I'm on YouTube. And, again, when you're steam cleaning carpeting, you end up having the TV on and watching a lot of different things yeah. that I never – well, I'll tell you one thing. From doing all the housework, uh, <laughs> for the first time ever, I watched, you know, Without a Trace, the that that series. Mm. It's really good. Mm. I mean, it was, it's been over for a decade. but <laughs> Right, yeah. But, I mean, I was like – Oh, this is really good. How did I miss this? Mm-hmm. And so just all the commercials. And then when we got to, you know, uh, just football, college football, Saturday and Sunday, whatever. I mean, the the hype is to the point of, and I was the biggest, I don't know if it's me that's changing, and I've said this about sports, or whether they're just going to the point of, they since they've got to cover it constantly, right. but I mean, the music and the drama behind mm football or you know just playing a game Mm -hmm. it just to me was i i came out of this week going is do we do we is everything contrived and bs'd i mean do we have to take it to a level which gets to just be absurd and in a way insulting and yeah right yeah and so i that was just one of the thoughts it's interesting because uh my wife and i discovered a series this goes back a few years the center with bill pullman Mm-hmm. By the way, did you know that was Bill Pullman's son who played Bob on Top Gun, on the new Top Gun? The nerdy no. guy, Bob. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Because it's yeah. A, you know what's your what's your basically what's your and, handle, right? And he goes, yeah, and Bob. He goes, Bob. No, no. What's your? That's Bill Pullman's son. You're yeah. kidding me? No. I. You really? We watch it again on vacation because it's a great. By the way, it's one of these great action movies. There's just just sit back and just. Point your eyes to the TV. I right? did. I, was, I told you I did a couple yeah. of weeks ago. I talked yeah. about it on the air just because right. I wanted. To, I was like, I got to listen to this thing in my five point one surround sound to see mm-hmm. how much they actually put into the sound of a movie. Right. Yeah. 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 And you know, wow. it's it was. We've watched it a couple of times. I've seen it a couple of times before, and so did my in laws. But it was like, nah, let's you know, turn it on. Let's watch it again. Right. And at the end. I had not seen the credits, and any, anyway, that was it was uh, a Bill Pullman son, and a few years. This goes back actually more than a few years ago. We found the, the this new this series. It's not new, but uh, the series called The Center with Bill Pullman, and it's very good. He's very good in it. I don't know if they're still making new seasons or not, but it's on now. It's on Netflix. It's been streaming for a while. But, you know, you just kind of have to search out these things. It's not a, you know, these things where where it's contrived. You see the production is contrived. Yeah. I've been. I've been almost almost like the Super Bowl halftime shows where the people come in and start. It's like, stop it. I've been on the set of a couple of, of shows that were being shot. And it was like, wow, this is and this goes back a long time. Well, over 20 years, actually. And they were coaching back then, but now, a friend of mine, uh, his wife actually is a is an executive at one of the studios, the TV studio, studios, and he was telling me about you know the the whole contrived thing, 
with especially the reality contest shows. So, you know, uh, the mass singer or America's got talent, Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you want to get, you're looking to get the audience's reaction, you know, and that's what they've been doing for a long, long time. 86690 Red Eye. We'll be right back with more Red Eye Radio with Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Harley and I'm Gary McNamara, the vice president in hip hop. You want to hear this story coming up. <laughs> Top of the Hour News is brought to you by House Products. Visit HouseProducts.com. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the planet, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Download our Red Eye Radio app today. Listen when and where you want if you can't listen live overnight. Uh, what I love uh, about this job is the fact that when I'm on vacation, Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Saturday, talking to a couple of people, and they were like, oh, your vacation's over tomorrow, huh? Yeah. Best thing about it is no difference. No difference to me whether I'm on vacation or working. And what I mean by that is uh, (laughs) any other job that I've ever had in my life, when there was a day or two left in vacation, there was always, oh, I have to go back to work. Oh, I got to go back. Uh, now it's like ah, I get to go back to work. <laughs> yeah, right. There is like no emotional letdown that vacation is over and you're back to work. It's like oh, vacation was good. Work's going to be good. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's uh, the best thing about this job, and it really is a great thing. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's uh, get to some of the interesting stuff while we were gone. This one, I nearly spit up my coffee and that was the stories that the Biden administration in order to solve the migrant problem uh, is thinking about if you cross the border of Texas you as a migrant part of the deal is you must stay in Texas (laughs) oh my god yeah. I saw that one the other day. Like, oh, my God. They're going to build a wall. <laughs> I'm going to say, the Democrats are finally going to build a wall. It'll be around Texas. But no, it's an, actually, it's an electronic wall because one of the things they're considering is ankle bracelets. <laughs> yeah. So every migrant that crossed would get an ankle bracelet. Yeah. So they could monitor that they were staying in Texas. Now. <laughs> What about the people that live in California that moved to Texas? What about them? You know, this is the the entire uh, approach by the left is really showing their desperation over and over again. How their playbook, their agenda is just crashing. It's imploding. Everything they're trying to do right now is failing. Failing. Drastically. And it's, you know, it it was inevitable. If you're paying attention at all and not just repeating what the left has been repeating for decades, well, they just want to come here and make a better life. Okay. Can they do that in your state? No! It's so blatant, so obvious, so in your face. And what they said back then was, remember, if you want to build a wall, you're a racist. (laughs) You don't want them in your state. (laughs) 
Why not? You're having to deal with what all of the border states have been dealing with for a long, long time. I mean, the xenophobia coming out of the administration here, and nobody has called the administration on their xenophobia yet. Right, right. Of wanting to build an electronic wall around Texas right. in order to keep migrants out of the rest of the blue states. Right. Can't make this stuff up. Then I saw the story about a number of young people that are fleeing Russia. And many of them are going to New York, which is compounding the problem there. But this has been going on for a long time. It's just that the border states are the ones who've been dealing with those coming across the southern border. They're the ones that have to take on the expenses. Yeah. And now New York can't do it. They don't want to do it. They don't want any part of it. All these major blue cities, you know, you you look at it. Somebody somebody posted some of the uh, video of some of the people using drugs. And my go-to in my mind when I saw the, when the video started in my feed, I thought Portland, right? Mm -hmm. Naturally, you see them. Uh, these drug addict, addicts that are on the street, they're leaning over, they're laying down, they're sleeping. You know, they're doing whatever. They're just, and they're everywhere. No, it was in Philly. It's happening in other cities. These blue cities don't care. They don't care about the crime. They don't care about, uh, you know, all the problems that are on their plate until it gets to a point where they can not control it. They were okay with this. In fact, they were the ones that created the policy that led to all of this. Everything from the border to bail reform. All of it. All of it was a decision by them and their constituents, the people that put them into power. Yeah, I did say that probably more than anything when I was on vacation and meeting with people. You know, uh, the Democrats can't. I, somebody actually said the Democrats just can't solve the problems. I said they created the problem. Right. Every major problem that we face today, every single problem we face is what the voters of the United States voted for. Yep. It's a choice. You didn't. I didn't. But the majority of the voters voted for this and they're getting exactly the only conclusion that you could come to in Mm -hmm. every single major issue that we face today where people are saying, well, this is pure insanity. In fact, let's go a step further. You are paying your taxes to the politicians to make your life harder. Yeah. Yep. No improvement. Your taxpayer dollars are going to make your life harder let's play this audio cut this is uh uh, eric adams on uh, msnbc okay here we go this is this is this is fascinating because critics on the right have noted that new york city is a sanctuary city and this migrant crisis comes with that territory what do you say to those who think uh you relinquish your right to complain about the stresses it places on your city because of that well, I, I think that those comments coming from those far right Trump like Republicans who are continue to try to distort the reality uh, that uh, we do not have real immigration reform, uh, that we should allow a true decompression strategy, uh, protect our borders in the right way and make sure that when you look at this city, the status of uh, right to shelter of uh, no one who created this uh, decades ago uh, took into account that we were talking about. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people potentially coming to come into the city. Well, no, we did. This is exactly this is exactly what Democrats voted for. What right. did you think there was going to be five that came across? Well, by they, the way, the rest of what he says is mumbo jumbo till he gets right. up to that point. Yeah. It's like he doesn't even know what to say. And he's finally figuring out, oh, I was supposed to be the new kind of Democrat. No, I'm the old kind of Democrat. We just sit there and we throw out mumble jumble that makes no sense. Yeah. 
And then well, it gets in and says, well, we didn't expect the problem to be that this bad. It's sanctuary policy that they made locally. You're you're practically inviting them. Yes. You want them to be there. Yes. And now there's a problem. Well, no, let's put it this way. The migrants want to be there. Mm-hmm. They have voluntarily gone. This incredible xenophobia that now that de- by Democrats' own standard of xenophobia, the xenophobia that is now mainstream in the Democratic Party and the the xenophobia with the hypocrisy. That's the thing that makes it really galling. Yeah, it's um, and it's not going to get any better. No, it's not. And then the, the administration, Biden administration, completely ignoring them, completely ignoring them. OK, we'll send somebody down. Uh, let me see. Well, uh, let me see. We'll uh, come up to meet with the, come come up to the White House. Sorry, you can't meet with the president. Right. Yeah. We'll send a representative to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stay where you are. We don't want you here. <laughs> We don't care about the problem. We helped to create the problem, and we're not going to do anything about it. Right. The Democrats created the problem. Hey, let's let's be blunt. Mayor Adams, stop being stupid. <laughs> stop playing stupid because we know you're not stupid, but you're playing stupid. This is happening because this is what the Biden administration wants to happen. Yeah. This isn't because of climate change. It's because of the Biden administration's border policies from when they took office and during the campaign where Biden invited everyone from the world to come to our border. Yep. Now it's happening. And simply the governors of these states are saying, would you like to go to a place that's a sanctuary city? What's a sanctuary city? It's where they have invited you to come and have said they will take care of you. Yep. And I'll go there. And they're not going to spend their local resources to assist with federal authorities there. You don't have to worry about that. That's the official policy. Well, man. No. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to go there, please. And the idiocy here, and like I said, that was the number one topic. I was at the opposite side of the state, but it was still the same thing mm-hmm. because of what was going on in western New York with the sexual assaults. Right. And the National Guard being called in. And now it's like National Guard. That's the thing now. National Guards now guarding hotels. Yeah. Well, who wants to go to these hotels? Right. Well, no. Where's the business yeah. That you would normally get in that hotel. And so what happened was in Erie County that I was in, they started moving migrants to more of the suburban areas of Erie County, Uh like of Amherst, New York. Mm -hmm. And that created a furor at city council meetings saying, what in the world's, you know, going on here now? And it's getting worse and worse and worse. And, uh, you know, you you saw that, uh, you know, uh, besides that, he just said, uh, you know, Adam said, we can't handle it. The financial, this is going to destroy the city. Well, defund the police. Right. No cash bail. Right. Where did you think it was going to go? Not not prosecuting crimes of stealing under (laughs) $1,000. Where the hell did you think this was going to go? What type of idiots are Democrats? Well, we thought this would all work because we thought that criminals were actually pretty good people. (laughs) You're giving an invitation to them to do what they do. Yeah. You're giving them a directive to break more laws. You're telling them it's okay. We expect it and we're not going to do anything about it. Over and over. Break the law. It's okay. Yeah, it is. It's amazing to go on vacation and not be doing this for a week and just feel what's going on, in, you know, in New York mm-hmm. and the fury of, of of people over it. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. And that's the thing I love was when the Biden administration when came, came out in the press, well, how would you keep them in Texas? Well, part of the deal, you'd have to wear an ankle bracelet. Like, oh my. Yeah, huh. right. I'm like, and Abbott's like, no, nah, sorry, it's not going to work. Yeah, that ain't going to happen. Yeah. Why our state and not somewhere else? Well, I'm assuming you'd have to stay in Arizona, too, or wherever you came in. I'm guessing. They didn't say that, but I'm assuming... Unless it's like, no, if you come in in there, if you come in in Arizona, California, we're sending you to Texas too. Everybody goes to Texas. Right. Yeah. Let Texas pick up the cost. Right. Which wow. I believe would be found unconstitutional. By the of way, course. And, and of course, it's also bigoted as the left mm-hmm. screen for years. Oh, the xenophobia is just, it's, and again, it's not, it's not, it's not shocking because of the identity politics where, they judge people by groups and not as individuals. So, again, the xenophobia here that's being shown by Democrats and Mayor Adams is, plus the hypocrisy is absolutely clear for everybody to see from the Democrat standard of what xenophobia is. They created that definition that if you're against illegal immigration, if you're against even in this particular case, think about this. Because and there's this whole debate going on. They're not legal. They're my, stop calling them migrants. They're they're illegal. Actually, they've been given temporary legal status in the United States, right? Through the administration, right? We, we don't may, agree with that process, right? We don't agree that they should be given that status simply because they're claiming asylum. So think about this. This xenophobia is even greater because. These are, by the Democrat standard, legal migrants, and the mayor and Democrats are rejecting them being there. Well, no, that's a great point. And a judge would looking at that saying they're here legally. They can go anywhere in the U.S. they want. Yeah. You can't create that rule. 86690-RED-EYE. Leased owner operators should be aware of four common revenue myths, lest you fall into the trap of mistaking revenue for profit. Myth one, concentrate on increasing revenue because costs will take care of themselves. This is not true, as costs are fundamental to the profit equation and the area where owners exert the most control to improve. Myth two, more revenue per mile is the answer to all problems. Though carrier pay packages differ in structure, revenue per mile really doesn't change much from company to company. But there can be a big difference in miles, overall gross revenue, reimbursements and fees. Myth three. All you have to do to be successful is run a lot of miles. In reality, revenue is only half of the profit equation. Costs are the other half. It's possible to generate a lot of revenue, yet spend a dollar ten to make every dollar. Myth four, you can tell how well you're doing by the size of your settlement check. The settlement check is only a part of the success picture. Miles driven, loads hauled, conditions, mechanical problems, time off, and especially costs all have to be considered. Owner-Operator Business 101 is provided by Shell Rotella with advanced synthetic technology. For more information, go to OverdriveOnline.com to the Overdrive's Partners in Business section of the website. For more detail on Business 101 and many other topics. Coming up, more with Gary McNamara and Eric Harley. It's Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Hurley, and uh, I'm Gary McNamara. So, yeah, that was the, uh, the 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 one thing that made me burst out laughing was uh, the Biden administration. Okay, we're going to uh, we're we're thinking of of uh, keeping all the migrants in Texas, and it was like, well, how do you plan on doing that? Then it came out, well, we'd put ankle bracelets on. Yeah, so I'm right. like, could you imagine the left? Could you imagine these these uh, uh, illegal immigrant groups around the United States if they were putting ankle well, bracelets? Imagine on. Donald Trump floated that idea right now as a part of his campaign. Yeah. Oh, here's I, what I would do. Right, I'd put ankle bracelets on them. Oh. Stop the presses! I know there'd be no other story for weeks. Chuck Todd <laughs> would unretire. I gotta say, <laughs> sorry, I'm not going anywhere. 
Jim Acosta would sign a 10-year contract. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they would lose their ever-loving minds. If, if Trump were to float this idea just as a campaign promise, yeah. yeah, no, I think we should put ankle bracelets on all of them. Are you kidding me? And there would be no other question that would be asked if it was floated by the media. Right. As this one has, this is what the Biden administration is contemplating right now. There would have been no other question if Trump was in Vietnam. Right. Exactly. No other question. Right. And this is, again, you know, you want to build a wall. Well, how dare you? Okay, well, we'll send some to your state. How dare you? <laughs> branch of government eric harley and gary mcnamara on red eye radio and he is eric harley and i'm gary mcnamara download our red eye radio app today listen when and where you want if you can't listen live overnight so i go straight to msnbc okay here we go all right (laughs) new york democrats are sounding a lot like staten island republicans talking about staten island a republican enclave in uh, in new york city Mm -hmm. one of the least populated boroughs but still Republican, and talking about the fact that, oh, yeah, we we expect, this is MSNBC running it, we expect the anti-immigrant sentiment on the the island of New York. Uh, But that surge in the associated protests would be easy to write off if they were limited to Staten Island or even if they were concentrated in more conservative areas upstate. But instead, we're seeing similar distrust and dismay uh, with the growing number of migrants in the city and beyond Hmm. from New York Democrats, too. And rather than provide leadership and support for these vulnerable newcomers, Democratic elected officials are instead either dithering or sounding a lot like Republicans themselves. New York City uh, Mayor Eric Adams provided a chilling example in his comments at a town hall on Wednesday. Quote, never in my life have I had a problem that I did not see an ending to. I don't see an ending to this. I don't see an ending to this. This issue will destroy New York City. Hmm. Adams has spent the last year railing against Texas Governor Abbott's policy of busing migrants from the border to to northern, often Democratic-controlled cities. The mayor's comments on Wednesday were no different on that front. He referred to Abbott as a madman down in Texas. But the idea that the newly arrived migrants mean that the city we knew Uh, We are about to lose, as we put as he put it on Wednesday, was a serious escalation of his rhetoric. And I want to make sure I want to make sure everybody understands. I did not read the article when I used the term that by the Democrats standard, what's going on here is massive xenophobia. But because in the MSNBC article, but the idea that the newly arrived migrants means that the city we knew about. Uh, were about to lose, as he put it Wednesday, was a serious escalation of his rhetoric, in both in terms of pessimism and xenophobia, <laughs> and earned him deserved condemnation from the Legal Aid Society and the Coalition for the Homeless. <clears throat> it's true that city resources have been stretched in providing shelter and support to more than 100,000 new arrivals, including more than 58,000 asylum seekers. Adams has repeatedly called for increased financial support from New York State and the White House in response and issued flyers discouraging more migrants from coming to the city. Absolute xenophobia. And by the way, MSNBC is making my point that by the Democratic standard, the Democrats in New York are engaged in xenophobia. How dare you? (laughs) <laughs> it's you know and, I, when and, when Hochul and Adams were going back and forth and they're still going back and forth but when it started I thought well all right one of them is going to get you know one of them is going to get the political hit 
Well, it's going to be Adams. He's the new guy. He's, you know, he started by begging the courts to undo their sanctuary city policy. This was bound to go badly. And I suspect it's not going to go well for him if he wants to win re-election. I suspect the party is going to turn their back on him. And, you know, that that infighting within the party... I don't I don't know how you fix the problem that they have that they created. But I can tell you they don't want Adams screaming for help. And by the Democrats standard, though, what Governor Abbott is doing should be cheered by Democrats. Right. How dare you keep them in Texas? Right. They should be allowed to come here where right. we have sanctuary city policy. And we welcome them. You don't welcome them. How dare you keep them here? Right. Reverse psychology. If 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 Governor Abbott had started with that, we're gonna we're gonna confine them to Texas. You can't do that. <laughs> okay. Here's a few busloads. We'll start with that. If they want to go there, we'll allow <clears throat> them to go that there, and we'll pay for their ride. <laughs> you know, they they just can't be consistent. The fact of the matter is, is that border states, border towns have been picking up the cost for this for a long, long time. And they've been screaming. The mayors, county officials have been screaming from the border for the longest time. And the party doesn't hear them. They don't care. Well, they're listening now. Here, L.A. Times. Biden's plan, which has not been finalized, would force certain migrant families to remain in Texas or possibly other border states, tracking their locations using GPS monitoring devices such as ankle bracelets. But the plan has drawn criticism of immigrant advocates as well as border state officials such as Abbott. Migrants and their advocates have already laid out objections to the plan. When people cross borders, their human rights come with them. Uh huh. So the one, uh, one uh, illegal immigration advocacy group, politicians like Abbott and Biden cannot continue playing games with the lives of children and families. She added, "Migrants are not hot potatoes." Excuse me. Why is Abbott even put in there? Abbott is saying. Would you like to voluntarily go right. to New York City or Chicago right. that are sanctuary cities? Why is that in any way wrong if it's voluntary? Now, we know the kidnapping charges that Newsom tried to throw out and others, they have fallen flat. Why? Because the states cover themselves legally. Yeah. Here's the contract you sign. Do you voluntarily wish to go there? Yeah, they're not forcing Governor, anybody. Governor Abbott is fulfilling the wishes of migrants who wish to go to sanctuary cities. Where is Abbott wrong? Well, you know, the left forever. You know, Texas is a racist state. It's a bigoted state. It's a bigoted mindset. They don't welcome migrants in their state. Now, as they also point out here in the L.A. Times, most of the migrants who've arrived in blue cities such as New York and L.A. Mm. from Texas were not bussed in by Abbott. They paid their own way to cities where job opportunities are plentiful and policies make it easier to move through the world uh, without documentation. Mm -hmm. You're making our point. Well, no, they've been going out of their way for, you know, on the policy level. They've been going out of their way. Well, you want a driver's license? Okay, we'll get your driver's license. And why should migrants and illegal immigrants that have money, why should they be the only ones that have the opportunities? This is part of migrant equity. Let's just use everything that the Democrats have put in their arsenal. Right, exactly. 
They just want to come here and possibly become a billionaire. Now, the left will keep you from being a billionaire, but if they had their way. Zero consistency on the left. None. You know, I really wonder what they're going to put on stage in Chicago next year, next summer. We're getting closer and closer. I just can't wait until their convention. Man, I want to see what is front and center prime time. The liberal transgender movement is going to is going to get primetime attention. I have no doubt about that. But how do you, if you're on that stage, prime time, what do you put in your speech? If you're one of the speakers, what do you put in your speech? To at that point, you're really trying to attract independence. In terms of policy, what do you promote? I can't wait. I can't wait I, until they get on stage. I was reading an article talking about the, the 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 plans. I don't think it would have that kind of an effect. But uh, the 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 plan of the Biden administration is to, over the next uh, you know nine months, buy back and fill back as much of of the strategic oil reserve as possible, mm-hmm. and then release it all mm-hmm. next August or September. Yeah. So prices come down drastically, right. and you can say, "See, we're curing inflation." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> well, the problem is is that in order to, you know, in order to get through with what they're what they would like to do, they have to continue spending in a big way. That's going to add to inflation. There's no way it won't. There's no doubt in my mind they've got a, a number of stupid moves. <laughs> right now on the list that they think will work. They were told by their own economists, don't pass this $1.9 trillion package. It will catapult, accelerate inflation at a great rate. And they did it anyway. Well, you see now, and we had said the, you know, the, the cause of, you know, part of the cause of inflation is mm-hmm. why you see a $2 trillion deficit now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the administration still as recently as last week promoting the fact of they're in deficit reduction mode, where in the deficit skyrocketing to $2 trillion. Yeah. And part of that is because of inflation. Right. Everything costs more. And so everything from the government costs Everything the government needs to do costs more. And there isn't the revenue coming in from the taxpayer. So the only place you can get it is to borrow it from future generations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the only it's the only thing they can do. It's the only playbook they've ever had. Well, the problem is during COVID, they overplayed it. You ramped it up and you spent to a point where there's no way you can move in that direction any further without accelerating inflation again. You know, one of the um, common elements in, and this was unsolicited comments that I heard over and over again, inflation is killing me. Inflation is killing me. A couple of small business owners. Things have slowed down. People aren't spending the same way. And I still have to pay what I've got to pay for. And inflation is killing me. Interest rates affecting their business because nobody's investing the way they did. You know, you look at the, you know, where it is right now. And we're at that point where the Fed really would like to accelerate that increase on on interest rates. They would love to get on top of inflation and really bring it down in a big way. Well, the problem is we're still not there yet. We're not done with inflation on a number of items. The rate of inflation may be coming down, but the cost of those items is still going up. Inflation is still very, 
real. We're not at a point of real deflation. Especially with uh, core inflation, the things mm-hmm. that people actually need and buy, with, right. whether it's food, right. uh, you know, housing. Right. Just because the inflation rate is lower doesn't mean those prices right. aren't going up. Of course they are, and it's on top of where they were during the highest point of inflation. 866-90-RED-EYE. Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Coming up on the top of uh, the hour, the New Mexico governor's suspension of the right to keep and bear arms. Wait till you hear her logic hmm. coming up. Possible automobile strike. This is really amazing. Even Politico was on it and understood what's going on here, that right. everything's going to be questioned about uh, what Biden is doing with EVs. Right. Because now what the UAW is looking for is for the taxpayer to pay their salaries. Right. Yeah, they want to be a public union. Right. And, you know, everyone knows with the EVs, we know it's happening already. Mm -hmm. Right. People are being hired for a lot less money. It was always going to, again, it was going to get to a point where... If you're forcing the OEMs to do this, they're going to need more public money. And now the unions are saying, yeah, we need our salaries to be paid by taxpayers. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. It's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show. From the Uniden America Studios, this is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the planet, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley and I'm Gary McNamara. Well, this... Made a lot of people go, what? After the uh, New Mexico governor, uh, Grisham, Michelle Grisham, said she will enact a temporary ban on carrying firearms in any public uh, space across the county. The governor made the announcement during a news conference on Friday. Sitting alongside the police chief and the county sheriff, the governor said part of this new order is a 30-day suspension on open and concealed carry on public property for anyone other than law enforcement or licensed security. I've warned everyone that we expect a direct challenge. Probably, as you're writing this, we're getting a challenge, and that's the way it should work. But I have to take a tough direct stand or basically I'm just ignoring the fact that we lost an 11-year-old, another child, said the governor. Now, I'm reading this is from Charles Cook's analysis of of her comments Mm. from National Review. And he writes, this is not how the law works in America. As far as I can see, there's nothing in any New Mexico statute that gives the governor the power to declare an emergency suspending the right to carry. And there's certainly nothing in the U.S. Constitution that does. If our elected officials were allowed to shelve our unalienable rights every time they believed that those rights were being abused by outlaws, then they wouldn't be unalienable rights. They'd be privileges. The governor knows this, which is why she said that not only that she has warned everyone that we expect a direct challenge But the arrival of such a challenge is the way it should work. These are words of a person who knows she is breaking the law 
but is resolved to do so anyway. Quote, I have to take a tough, direct stand. Uh, end of quote. She insists giving the game away. Actually, she does not. She has to uphold her oath of office. Just as bad is that the governor does not even believe she's doing anything useful. The governor says she does not expect criminals to follow the order. But she hopes it is a, quote, resounding message, end of quote, to everyone in the community to report gun crimes. Hmm. The point here, uh, the point here is, uh, is that if everyone did it and uh, I wasn't legally challenged, you would have fewer risks on the street. And I could safely say to every New Mexican, particularly those folks living in Albuquerque, I believe that you you're safer for the next 30 days. We'll have to wait and see. Well, this is absolute nonsense. The governor doesn't expect criminals to follow her illegal order, but she hopes that it will send a resounding message to the people who aren't criminals and that this in turn will create fewer risks on the street. What? That, that right there is a practical problem with almost every gun control measure that's ever been proposed in the United States. It's almost elegant in its futility, as data from Florida and Texas has shown. Carriers are between six and seven times more law-abiding than the police. These people don't need to be sent a message because they aren't the problem in the first place. The problem, the only problem, is the criminals, the very people that the governor acknowledges will not will be unaffected by her order. What mountain of tyrannical stupidity she has built, I expect it to be short-lived. I think it's a great opportunity to understand what's in the mind of a liberal. You can't understand because there is no critical thinking skill involved in the governor and what she had said. But it's fascinating to follow it. As I say, I I look at a human brain of a lot of uh, liberalism today, liberalism in brains, is that you're just completely emotional. Everything is emotion, and there's just electronical sparks going off left and right, and whatever your first urge is, you just say, do it, whether science backs you up, whether the truth backs you up, whether the law backs you up, it doesn't matter. You're just, you're an emotional child is what you are, because this is this kind of reaction and this no common sense here whatsoever coming out with an unconstitutional order that she admits will do nothing to stop the criminal, but will send a message to the law-abiding gun owner. What the hell does that even mean? Well, it's clear that you, you do it. For show, you do it for some kind of political street cred. And it's an overreach in power, and it's the only thing that's going to come. She already knows the courts will shut her down on this. She knows it. She said as much. And yet they'll still keep trying to do these things. They know. Going in, they're going to lose in court. Well, let it go the full measure in court. I still get the political street cred. And over and over again, they've demonstrated this on a number of issues. We don't care. We're going to act anyway. We don't care that the the courts will eventually shut us down. We're going to do it anyway. And we're going to keep doing it. And when the court shuts us down over here, we'll do something else. It's it's the new playbook. We'll just sit and wait for the court to respond. And this, <laughs> source New Mexico dot com. No clear penalty for violating New Mexico public health order yeah, on guns. Right, yeah, right. By the way, we predicted this would be <clears throat> uh, something they would try. That, dr- that if you if you talk about <clears throat> public emergencies health emergencies by anyone in any position of power. Once you go down that road, wait for them to do it on gun control and use it as a measure for gun control. And here we are. 
Governor Grisham directive only mentions civil administrative penalties, not criminal ones. Quote, responsible gun owners are certainly not our problem, she says. So she says responsible gun owners are not the problem. And criminals won't be affected by this. And criminals will not be affected by the law. Then who will be? Nobody. The New Mexico Health Secretary, Patrick Allen, signed a public health emergency order prohibiting anyone from possessing a firearm. Yeah. The order applies only within cities or counties that have an average of 1,000 or more violent crimes per 100,000 residents per year since 2021 and have more than 90 firearm-related emergency rooms uh, visits per 100,000 residents from July of 2022 to July 2023. Uh, the order also applies to state property, public uh, uh, schools, public parks, and uh, the, uh, the city of uh, Albuquerque mm-hmm. and the county that the city of Albuquerque is in. However, the order does not give authorities any power to imprison people. It only specifies that people who violate it may be subject to civil administrative penalties. This could include the loss of a permit to carry a concealed firearm, but the order does not specifically mention concealed carry permits. Asked how the order will be enforced and what the penalty will be for violating it, Grisham told reporters on Friday, we're likely dealing with misdemeanors, but she was not specific. She doesn't think that the Albuquerque Police Department could enforce the order, but the New York, the New Mexico State police could do so because they're required to carry out executive orders. I'm sure they have the manpower, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, again, um, it is the, the same thing they've been doing on a number of fronts. We'll just throw anything against the wall. We know it's not going to stick. We'll tell you from the get-go, from the outset, it's not going to work. It's not going to do anything, and the courts are going to shut us down. But we're doing it anyway. Wow. It's desperation. Well, as you said, it's a, you know, it's it's a political move, but in this with what's going on, is it a good political move? Well, see, <laughs> you're you're counting on building that street cred politically, but really, where's that come from today? How do you get it? How do you gather it? If you're not getting, if you're not doing the things that are effective, then how do you expect to get any long-lasting credibility to build from that? Uh, She said she expected someone to legally challenge her executive order, adding that she welcomed the debate and fight about making New Mexicans safer. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. Otherwise, you would have left this to your state lawmakers. There's where the debate is. Have the people and their representatives have this debate before you enact it. Well, you don't want that. Why is that? Because nothing would change. Because you can't take away their Second Amendment right. Uh, The challenge arrived on Saturday when the National Association of Gun Rights said it would file a lawsuit in federal court against the governor, citing the 2021 U.S. Supreme Court ruling easing gun restrictions. The president of the group, Dudley Brown, accused the governor of throwing up a middle finger to the Constitution and the Supreme Court. Her exact executive order is a blatant disregard for Bruin. She needs to be held accountable for stripping the God-given rights of millions away with the stroke of a pen. Actually, she didn't, but mm-hmm. that's what she wants to do. Right. Um, yeah, it's just you you look at this, you just you shake your head and uh, she's acknowledged that the violation of a public public health order is the lowest level of violation. The point is we better have the debate about what's necessary to reduce the number of particularly illegal firearms and our ability to go after bad actors. But you're showing what you believe it is. Right. You've set out the first debate point, Mm -hmm. which is you're claiming that legal gun owners aren't the problem. Yet the ban is against legal gun owners because unlawful gun owners 
were unlawful before. Right. No, I, I think somebody posted it that way over, over the weekend. She made the debate against, she made the debate point, the most effective debate point against herself. <laughs> no, you're right. She did. She said she's having the she debate in her, her own, own mind. Debate. <laughs> she started it and ended it in the same speech. What an idiot. I'm sorry. New Mexico, you get what you deserve. Yep. I know this is going to be shut down by the courts. I know it's not going to affect the bad guy. And I really don't want to go after the good guy. So what the hell are you doing? The uh, the county sheriff there, uh, John Allen, a Democrat, said he was wary of placing deputies in positions that could lead to civil liability conflicts as well as a potential risk posed by prohibiting law-abiding citizens from their constitutional right to self-defense. Mm. Allen indicated the sheriff's deputies would not enforce the ban. Similarly, the mayor of Albuquerque said the governor had made it clear that state law enforcement, not Albuquerque police, would be responsible for enforcement of the civil violations of that order. Nobody wants to touch this. No, they don't. In law enforcement. And for the head of the state law enforcement, you really want any of your officers out there, any of the state police, violating people's constitutional right? I did see, though, I think the DA... Local DA said they're not going to prosecute anybody hmm. on this. <laughs> but well, it, it's, it would be a waste of time. You're going to lose. If you're a DA and you wanted to take this, you know you're going to lose. Just, I mean, complete idiocy. Well, it's it's something that is so far gone that... It's it loses right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. It goes nowhere fast. And the other thing is, too, I mean, I think one of the things is and I don't know whether she's trying to be uh, uh, what's the word I would use here? Uh, sneaky. Well, mm. We can do 30 day orders. And then by the, you know, by the time the court gets at it, then, you know. By the time the court, well, the court could issue an injunction. Court could issue an injunction tomorrow to stop oh, yeah. it. Right, right. Or you, today, might, that that could stop yeah. today. We might see it. You might see it today. And so there was that thought process. Well, they just they want to see how far they can get away with the mm-hmm. law, you know, by mm-hmm. doing stuff like this. Right. But you see the reaction from what I could see was the exact opposite. You saw the protest with all the people with the guns, and somebody pointed out all these people had guns and nobody was shot. Right. Well, she she completely destroys her own debate with her own statement. She points out to everybody reality yeah. and then yeah. still acts delusional. Which which uh, uh, brings us to this question. Is she past her prime? <laughs> Yeah, she is. <laughs> Clearly. That goes, what was it, Nikki Haley? Somebody threw that at Uh Yeah, it was uh, yeah. Don Lemon. Oh, that's right, Don Lemon. And that okay, catapulted yeah. his career. <laughs> He's probably the number one person in liberal <laughs> media right now. I, he's It just skyrocketed. Skyrocketed. It would. It was so good for him. It the payoff was unbelievable. Eight six six ninety red eye. Lines open for your calls. Eight six six ninety red eye on Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Let's go to James in Santa Fe, New Mexico. 
on uh, the uh, the governor and her unconstitutional order. Hi, James. You're on Red Eye Radio. Hi. Um, I think this is nothing more than just a test. She shut down the state for two years with what, with one of her emergency orders uh, during COVID. You know, violating our right to uh, freedom of religion and freedom of assembly, and. The, the politics in the in the urban parts of the state are out of control. There is a if you want to Google this and you could even comment on that because it's completely totally relevant. There's a very infamous case from 2019 that applies today where a teen who was 17 years old was convicted for uh, murder, a drug deal gone bad in the park. And this guy's name was Santiago Armijo. Uh, if you just want to Google teen gets. Yeah, all right. All right, right, but, uh, all right fine. But, Albuquerque. Right. But what, what's the point of it? The point is they're creating the problem in Albuquerque, in Bernalillo. The crime oh, yeah. is out of control because they – and, and, the, and these gangbangers, these young, these young criminals know this. And they know that, hey, you know, if you, if you, if you do a, a drive-by, you do some sort of like degree murder, they know there, there's going to be no punishment because they know all these prosecutors and these judges are, right. are like social justice gone wild. Well, yeah, and it's not and unique. So they know they're going to yeah. get away with it. And it's not unique to Thanks, Albuquerque. Chance. In fact, there's no. an there's a article in the New York Post. Uh, about young kids robbing bars mm-hmm. and saying we're not going to—they're not going to do anything to us. We're juveniles, right? Nothing's going to happen to us, right? I think it was in the front section of the New York Post just uh, right yesterday. We'll get to more of your calls and comments uh, coming up, uh, uh, you know, on this because uh, yeah, I mean, it's look—it's not going to go anywhere. It's clearly unconstitutional. Yep, it's a political statement. It's not going to go anywhere. No, it's not. Yeah. So good, you know you want to listen again with our podcast, available on our app and at RedEyeRadioShow.com. And he's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara, uh, 866-90-RED-EYE. One thing it it does show you, you know, besides the uh, absolute, um, you know, ridiculous mindset of today's modern uh, liberal uh, in what the New Mexico governor is attempting to do here, which makes no sense. Even by her own explanation, it makes no sense. But it is the willingness of the Democrats to throw away the Constitution. We've talked about this many times before. You see it in the prosecution. You know, when we were gone, they talked about that the uh, grand jury in Georgia also uh, wanted to hand down indictments of Lindsey Graham. Mm-hmm. I mean, things that are just absolute free speech issues. You know, you've got Democrats wanting to criminalize it. Yeah. You know, just yeah. absolutely free speech issues. They don't believe in the First Amendment. They don't believe in freedom of speech. They don't believe in freedom of religion. They don't believe in the Second Amendment uh, of the uh, United States. They don't believe in due process under the law. They don't believe in our representative, uh, 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 you know, government of having the Senate and having an electoral college. And you have to ask yourself these questions. What makes you an American? We've asked that question before. What makes you an American? Is it just geography? Or should there be some type of belief in the constitutional system because our country is about one thing, and it's the Constitution of the United States. Yeah. That's it. Right. Everything starts there. When they when the left says, well, the Constitution isn't binding, these words over the years like living and breathing. Living, breathing document. document. Yeah. They yeah. actually believe it. What they What they're trying to say is we don't want to abide by the Constitution. The Constitution is outdated. It's old. (laughs) So we're just going to do our thing. 
and we'll wait for the court to hash it out. They know they're losing on the issues. The governor of New Mexico isn't wanting to have the debate. In fact, she disarmed the entire debate <laughs> in her statement. She, she, had, she had the debate in her own mind and then talked about what the debate is. <laughs> she laid it out of how a debate would go and ended the entire discussion right there. Right. Because they can't have the debate. Because they do know they will lose. Because they know where this is going. When you when you actually just when you just take all of her talking points, I'm going to put a ban. Uh, we're going to have a temporary ban on the Second Amendment for 30 days. Nobody can carry any type of weapon, yeah, anywhere in public whatsoever. Now, we know the criminals won't abide by it. And we know that legal gun owners are not the problem, but we're helping it sends a message. The message is <laughs> rob. If you're a criminal, rob now. Yeah. Nobody's going to be out on the streets with a gun. Right. Well, that's not going to be true because I don't believe that any gun owner is going to follow that rule. No, I don't believe so. Any legal gun owner. No. The way it seemed, they weren't doing it. At the, the protest I made, saw over the weekend. She made the point. They're not the problem. They aren't the problem. And so if you're a liberal out there and, and wonder why we're confused by you, why we say, well, you can't be taken seriously, the governor of New Mexico is one of those reasons. Yep. Your belief in the in the radical transgender movement. Yep that a biological man can be a biological woman because the biological man says so. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. Does it make any scientific sense? Nope. Which I guess that's where the be-all, end-all is. That's a scientific argument. And every argument they throw at you can be literally destroyed, which is why they don't want to have the debate. In fact, I don't no, think she don't. really wishes to have the debate either because I think she should be the one. Okay, fine. You put this order in. Why did you put the order in? Did you Do you believe it will stop crime? No, I've already stated it. It's not going to stop crime. Criminals aren't going to pay attention to it. Well, then what do you, why are you doing it? Well, by the way, this isn't about legal gun owners. I love this. That's the beautiful part. We're, we're going to take away your rights. But it's not really about you. Right. Because we know you're not the problem. Right. Ah, I mean, come on. And if this were <laughs> actually enforceable, you would be the only ones affected. But we know you're not the problem. Right. <laughs> You'd be the only ones going to jail because we're not going to put real criminals in jail. We know you're not the problem, oh my gosh. but we're doing something. At least we're doing something. Oh, we haven't got that one yet, have we? Well, at least she's doing something. Yeah. No, that's... Remember that argument? The we used to get stupid, that all the time. The stupid response when liberals do something stupid. You might not like the argument, guys, but at least she's doing something, oh, remember and the, something has to be done. Remember the Iran deal? Well, at least he's doing something. Yeah, we got that for that one, didn't we? You mean enabling Iran? Yeah, that's something. Sometimes it's best to do nothing. Yeah. Or sometimes it's best to enforce criminal laws and sometimes, go after the criminals. Sometimes you do something that has meaning and purpose. Hey, I have an idea. Why don't you, instead of this uh, meaningless order, why don't you actually, you could do something that politically would be much better, mm. which would be go after harshly criminals who are illegally using guns. Yeah. There's a thought. I don't think that gun owner groups are going to be upset about that. 
No. He illegally used a gun in the commission of a crime. Well, should we punish him or should we go like Bragg in New York City? We, you know, look, if you're if you just use the gun to threaten someone and you don't actually pull the trigger in the commission of a crime, come on, we got to let you go. People make mistakes. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it is further indication of their desperation. The playbook was bound to fail. Their agenda was bound to fail. But the reason they keep doing it is because they're still winning elections. Yeah. Yep. They believe they can get away with that. She's anything. not like yeah. Abrams, someone who claims to be the governor falsely. She's the governor of New Mexico. She's not a media darling. Yeah. She won an election. She believes this will help her politically. Yes. Will it? Look, it's still working for now, so you keep doing the same thing. But eventually, you can't. Look, I'm convinced, too, that Adams in New York City, as a mayor, his days are numbered. And I started thinking that, and I thought, you know, there's no way he can keep up this screaming about the whole migrant crisis thing. Really, the first move, or one of the first moves, was the tell for me when he went to the court and said, undo the sanctuary city policy. <laughs> like, what? Well, you you guys have the political power. The city council can do that. You guys can vote to do that. You don't have enough Republicans to get in your way on that. And I thought to myself, I thought, well, it's only a matter of time. And then Hochul throws him under the bus. He goes back after her. And then she says, you know, whatever she said about him, it's just the back and forth. That is indicative of him not being a long-term mayor. Because he's going to get the blame for the migrant crisis and his own party is tying his hands as to what to do about it. The White House will send a representative. Don't come here. We'll send a representative to you. And I don't know. Um, her liberal base, the governor of New, of, of New Mexico, her liberal base could support this. The far left is definitely going to uh, keep supporting her because at least she did something. At least she tried. And they're the same ones con- screaming that the Constitution is a living, breathing document and crap like that. And, and that save, it's outdated. And save democracy. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're the ones they're the ones screaming the same thing. It's how she got elected. Mm-hmm. But eventually it will stop working. Because you're going to have to do something long-term that's effective. I mean, we could see an injunction come from the court today, as soon as today in, in New Mexico. We'll see. And and that's it. The far left, I think there's two schools of thought. There's, hell yeah, at least she tried. And then there's, no. We want longer-lasting things. Now, I don't know what... But she... But can she... constitutes longer lasting because in in oh. a matter like this, you would have to go in and you would have to, again, do the same thing through your state lawmakers. And that is to violate people's constitutional right. And you, you're not going to get away with that. Well, if Democrats can't stop crime because they're not willing to go after crime. Then the only thing they can do. Is something like this. Yeah. And to it's show that they're sure. trying because what they're going to say is that the, the if and I'm talking about this on a national scale on this. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the only thing we can do because uh, we uh, must continue the defunding of the police. We must continue with the no cash bail. 
excuse me, the uh, the yeah, the no cash bail. And we need to continue uh, with the fact that people only steal to feed their families Mm -hmm. and therefore under a thousand dollars is okay. Yeah, they really can't back off from that. No. You don't really see a lot of these cities backing off big time off those policies. Some are. Mm. And you are changing some in the city councils, but still the strategy is still the same. So I said the New York Post story of kids now, you know, committing criminal acts because mm-hmm. they say we're not going to get punished. And they're they're blunt about it. So yeah. The victims are blunt about it. Right. Kid, why are you doing it? You're going to get in trouble. No, I won't. I'm a kid. They don't punish. They don't punish. We can get away with whatever we wish to get away with. Look, I think the perfect example is, does there seem to be any, any real serious consideration from the administration to stop the migrant crisis? No. 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 I don't care. It's quite the opposite. It's what they want. I I believe that the Democratic Party right now is only left with one thing since since they survive on victim oppressors they need to keep everybody all their constituents as victims the only way you can keep them as victims is ensure they don't have a good job yep. crime is rapping yep they can't get a good education and then they can continue to say you're victims, you see how terrible it is from the policies that they created, hoping that their constituents who vote for them won't realize that they're the ones creating the problem. All right. 86690 Red Eye. We'll be right back with more Red Eye Radio with Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. In Toronto Radio, he's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. There it is, a headline. Big auto workers strike could hit with Biden's policies in the balance. We'll get to that coming up. That's from Politico. Yeah. And it's something that we have uh, talked about. Finally, finally, Mm. somebody did a poll on reparations in California. Oh, yeah? With California voters. I don't think, though, they did it with the amount, though. I think they just did uh, reparations in general. Okay. Goes down to defeat in California by a two-to-one margin without any amounts talked about yeah i i believe wow. in this poll here so we'll get uh, to uh, that oh and a whole bunch more This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the planet, we are Red Eye Radio. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Wow. 22 years ago. Yeah. Today. Wow. I was talking uh, with my brother-in-law about it um, and what I was going through on uh, everybody has their story. Mm-hmm. of 9-11 and where I was. And, and of course, I was I was at work. I was uh, at that time we were uh, our studios were in our flagship station, WBAP, and we were in Arlington. Uh, the overnight show had ended and I was uh, at that time doing comedy voices for the WBAP morning show with Al Jay. 
and we were preparing to do that. And of course, the world changed and things got very serious. It was anything, uh, uh, you know, at anything and everything about what was going on was, of course, going on the air immediately. And there was this this coverage. And I remember driving home during that time because we all watched the second plane hit the tower and we were standing in the studios and the first thought was of my wife and children. And I said, well, guys, I got to go home. I got to go find my kids. I've got to go and make sure my family is going to be safe. And on the way home, I was driving home. There were no planes in the sky, which is the the drive home between Arlington and, and my house. You go past the airport. And there were so many people on the road. It was morning traffic. And I was wondering how many people are listening to their radio right now and know yet. Because it had just, the second plane had just hit minutes earlier. And before I got home, the first tower fell. And I walk in, my oldest daughter, who had already graduated high school, she's sitting there. She says, Dad, the, the tower just fell. It just fell. You could tell she was in shock. And it was just one of those moments in life where you know, as a parent, as a citizen, as a person, the world just changed. And my, at that time, soon-to-be son-in-law was at Camp Pendleton finishing up Marine boot camp. And, you know, we all thoughts were what's going to happen from, from here. There were no flights for days. Uh, where, you know, is, is it over? I mean, that, that was the first question I think in everybody's mind because the cameras were on the buildings, the twin towers in New York city, but, I remember being in the control room and the first tower, the black smoke coming out of the the tower, and, and we're looking at it, and they're showing it. But they weren't sure at that point what had happened yet. And it was it was a clear day in New York City. It was a – so how would a plane hit a building? And we were waiting to find out. And then we watched as the second plane hit the other tower. And then from there, the news out of Pennsylvania and the Pentagon. And it just, it's one of those moments in history where everything just absolutely changed. In in the days after, you know, you, you think about The people in New York City, uh, then President Bush and the response. And as a nation, uh, we're grieving, but we're also angry. I I remember uh, I was thinking about this yesterday because I went, wow, 22 years. And and I and it's still so strong with us because of I, I think in most Americans who went through it. Uh, because it was live on on uh, on TV, and I remember though, and it had to be 1965 or 1966. And it was funny because when I was back in New York, I thought about that as I was going past. I went past the house we grew up in. My great nephew was with me, and I, we were in the air, and I said, "Let's go back, go back to the house that I grew up in." And so we we did, but we passed a house there. A guy that I went to elementary school with. I remember sitting at his house, and it was probably. December 7th, either of 1965 or 66. And might have been 66 because uh, I believe we were uh, there in arms, in harm's way had come out, uh, you know, like a year before. A mm-hmm. uh, movie about, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor and what happened afterwards. And I just remember how big, you know, I wasn't alive when Pearl Harbor happened. But I remember, even though Eric wants to make, you believe I was, <laughs> uh, but I remember how big it was. And I remember thinking 
all right, that's like 25, 26 years ago. Mm-hmm. Well, it's 22 years now for 9-11. And it's something, the difference is nobody saw what was going on in Pearl Harbor. You yeah. didn't know. I mean, you might have seen it in the next morning paper, but nobody really knew what was going on. I mean, part of the, the, part of the challenge back then was, you know, communications at that point. But for, for me, I was, on that day, I was uh, asleep. And, you know, my cell phone rang, and it was my buddy Jeff going, See what happened in New York City. He was on his route. He was a traveling salesperson in and in, in southern New York. He said, tell me what's going on. I flick it on. I'm like, wow, a plane must have hit there or whatever. Right. And we're sitting there talking. The second plane hit. I'm like, yeah. I got to go. Yeah. Okay, at that point, I said, another plane just hit. My God, it's terrorism. Got to yeah. go. Right. And then the phone rang from work. And I remember I was watching, and they called me into work. Uh, because the I was working afternoons, but the midday guy was on vacation. So they wanted me in there in case they went local to get commentary from our senators, congresspeople, whatever. Well, the national news, and we would have been, we were still Disney, so we were covering, it was ABC News that was covering it for us. Mm-hmm. And I remember just standing there in the control room, and Bob, our boss at the time, looked at me and he said, are, are you angry that you're not on the air covering this? I'm like, what? He must have seen the look on my face with just shock. It was after, I think, the first or second one. I can't remember which one had fallen down. I go, no, they're covering it much better than I can hear. So I'm watching, you know, the broadcast. No, it's the last thing I'm thinking about is I need to be on the air. In fact, I didn't know what to say. And that whole rest of the day is a, really on the air because I did go on the air was a blur. They would cut me in between the national coverage, and I would bring on, uh, I think uh, Kay Bailey Hutchison came on at that time when she was senator. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I can't remember who else came on because it was a blur. I just remember her coming on because I knew her. And, but it was, it was just a complete blur. And uh, later on that afternoon when I was going home, probably in the evening, I do remember because I lived right along the flight path where they take off of the airport. I mean, I lived, right. not now, but yeah. back then, I lived really close to the airport. Yeah. It took me five yeah. minutes to get there. Now the yeah. airport's huge. So by the time planes would be, most of the time they were taking off to the south. You know, sometimes they'd come in, but the majority of the time, if there's a northerly wind, they're coming in from the south, but mostly they're taking off from the south. And to sit on my porch and everything was completely quiet, mm-hmm. that was, that's when silence was loud. And it was just such a, you know, what in the world, you know, has happened on this date. And the only other, th- the other thing that's a clear memory to me is when there was stuff about uh, anthrax going around in the building next to us. Mm-hmm. You know, they were concerned that there was powder or whatever, and everybody was paranoid about anthrax and uh, what was going on there. But I remember the Friday right after, because it was a Tuesday, I believe it happened. Mm-hmm. And by Friday, we had our fundraiser, and we our expectation, remember, was to raise like 40000 or something. Mm-hmm. We raised like, you know, 10 times that amount in just a couple of hours. Right. I'll never forget the woman bringing up, basically coming up with money and saying, this is for my, you get my whole unemployment check this week mm-hmm. for the people of New York. Mm-hmm. And just sitting there in the parking lot of, the because uh, the new Dallas Cowboys stadium wasn't there yet, but it was the baseball, the old baseball stadium. Wow, mm-hmm. nothing was there. <laughs> yeah. Just the just the oh. old baseball stadium mm-hmm. was there, and we were out in the parking lot, and the lines were as long as you can see, and we were out there just all day. And so there was that incredible unity that existed. I do remember it was probably the next day as we were analyzing it, saying, you know, because we we were all hearing, you know. The, we, you know, never forget, never forget, never forget. And we go, what does that mean, never forget? Will we enact policies or will we just in our minds not forget but allow it to happen over and over again it as a policy statement or whatever? And looking at it 22 years later, we have forgotten. Yeah. And in our policy, maybe not as individuals, we haven't forgotten and won't be brought to a motion today but policy-wise, and who, again, we have put into elective office, 
we have forgotten. Well, you look at going into Afghanistan the following mm-hmm. month mm-hmm. and then compare that to the exit of Afghanistan. Yep. And the series of mistakes and lies that were told during that exit, just during the exit. And still today, by this administration, you know, we talk about how our allies and our own troops suffered so many losses in the battle against terrorism, but specifically in Afghanistan. And what an insult it must be to all of the Gold Star families. And we've heard from them recently. But it's also an insult to everyone, every citizen who survived 9-11, who went through that, that period and lived through that period, and also dealt with other acts of terrorism and watched it happen all around the world to have a commander-in-chief that was willing to lie. And then at the end, oh, yeah, it was always going to happen that way. Is one of the greatest insults, one of the worst situations you can be in, and also further proof that he's not suitable as commander-in-chief. He's not capable. Well, that happened when we were gone on vacation, too. The former top general of the United States Marine Corps ripped Biden's disastrous plan to withdraw from the war in Afghanistan. One, the ex-military leader said history would view as a mistake. Uh, Rep- or General Representative General Frank McKenzie, who retired in April of 2022, mm. was head of the U.S. Central Command during the withdrawal, including the suicide bombing attack that killed 13. Uh, in an interview Sunday, he says he feels a withdrawal, which drew widespread criticism, and which he had uh, or previously defended will be looked at as a terrible mistake from plan to execution. Uh, he said the March uh, that in March 2022 that he would regret the withdrawal for the rest of his life, a decision that allowed the Taliban to quickly seize control of Afghanistan as Americans and refugees fled to safety. Also came out, you know, yesterday that every single, there was never one of his senior leadership in the command mm. that told him the withdrawal was a good idea. Mm-hmm. Every single person to a T right. was against it. That also came out we were on, when we were on vacation. Yeah. Uh, and so you look at that and and America wanting, remember, initially to get out and then regretting it later. Well, maybe we shouldn't have gotten out. Right. Americans wishing to get out. It didn't change at all. Americans have an expectation that our enemies should be defeated within six months. And if not, we should pull out. Right. That's what Americans believe. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a year. I don't know. I don't call mm-hmm. it a year, whatever you would. But there's a limited time span. And as we stated from the very beginning, the fight from Al-Qaeda, and you and I were on this, even though we didn't work together from day one, this will be a fight for the rest of our lives. If we're not in it for the rest of our lives, then we're enacting the wrong policies. Well, because we can't pretend that if we pretend the war is over, that our enemy will. No, they, they, they will clearly find our weak spot. That's what they're looking to do. At every turn in the moment, we decide our, we're, if we close our eyes, the bad guy will go away. That's when we'll face another massive attack. It's only a matter of time. If we're going to pretend that the war is over, if we're going to pretend that the enemy is done, then it's only a matter of time. And they have set up a terrorism super state in Afghanistan. And there's proof of then the proof of what I just said since our withdrawal from Afghanistan. And it's only a matter of time. They have tremendous resources in Afghanistan. And at some point, one, if not all of those terror groups in Afghanistan will act out. 
And we absolutely have to be prepared. 86690 Red Eye. Hi, I'm Jen Loomis, a transport safety expert at JJ Keller, and I'm here to share a tip on roadside inspections. Once a roadside inspection is completed, the officer will close it out, which involves the officer writing or typing up the report. The more the officer found during the inspection, the longer this will take. If violations were discovered, most officers, as a courtesy, will explain the violations to the driver. If there were any out-of-service violations, the officer will normally explain what must be done to get the out-of-service order lifted. Drivers need to be very attentive during this part of the inspection. The driver also needs to read and understand the complete inspection report. After receiving the inspection report, the driver has 24 hours to get the roadside inspection report to the motor carrier. If the driver will not be returning to a company facility within the next 24 hours, the driver needs to know to get it on the way to you via email, mail, or fax within 24 hours. This tip was brought to you by J.J. Keller & Associates. Visit us at jjkeller.com. We'll be right back with more Red Eye Radio with Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and I'm Gary McNamara. The other thing I remember uh, going back to that uh, time is it seemed, you know, that it would, and, and I'm sure. Well, you were you you were working. That's right. You were working overnights then. I was not, mm-hmm. but I remember how long I would stay up for weeks afterwards. Remember, because of coverage went on for weeks. I slept weeks for about weeks. thirty or forty minutes at a time. Yeah, I remember staying up till three, four in the morning, mm-hmm. and then falling to sleep just watching you know, with the recovery efforts. And you know, you're just wondering how many people were lost in it because you didn't know. Remember, well, the goal was to hit two buildings full, and right. you know, at that point, and get fifty thousand killed. Right. Yeah, and and also, you know, the question: Were they done? Would yeah. would the enemy attack in some other way? Right. Because because when you think about it, it just wasn't you, we were talking about the the shot at the Pentagon and that the the uh, other plane that crashed in Pennsylvania was heading to the White House. And it was yeah. like, well, at that point, that seemed so mind boggling that it would be four different targets. Right. The next question is how many more targets? Right. In how many days? Right. And could they attack right. another way? Not by plane, but in any other way. There was a lot of tension in the air. Consider yourself canceled if you don't listen nightly. Red Eye Radio. Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carly and I'm Gary McNamara. This week is National Truck Driver Appreciation Week. And, of course, we uh, like to show our appreciation all the time for all of America's truck drivers who keep the economy going. Good times and bad times. America's truck drivers are there and they keep rolling. And we want to say Thank you. In fact, I want to say thank you also as each day throughout the month of September, we're going to recognize some truck drivers. And uh, this morning we want to say hi to Adam from Kalamazoo, Michigan. He drives for Saddlesbury Trucking, and he has been trucking for 11 years. Kevin in Nashville, he works for Waste Management. Thank you to all the men and women out there behind the wheel America's truck drivers are the backbone of the economy. We also want to thank our sponsors for making all of this possible. They include Shell Rotella, Denny's, Mercer Transportation, Motel 6, House Products, and the St. Christopher Truckers Relief Fund. You can go to RedEyeRadioShow.com for more. And again, we say thank you to America's truck drivers. 
866-90-RED-EYE. Well, a couple of other news items. Uh, The CDC says existing antibodies can work against the new COVID variant. Well, thank goodness. Are you like me, though? Are you like everyone, not just me? Where it's like, who the hell knows what to believe anymore from anybody on it? Well, you know, uh, my daughter, one of my daughters, uh, she got COVID last week, actually the work week before last, it was right before we were going on vacation. She lives about an hour away and it was all throughout her household, but she and, and one of her children had it the worst. I mean, she was struggling to breathe and she said in a few days it was, it was over. Um, you know, no underlying conditions or anything, but sometimes you're going to get, if you, if you get it, depending on underlying conditions or just where your immunity might be in that, you know, in that, in that moment, it might be harder for you, but you hit on something just now that I think has been the problem from the beginning and was always going to be the problem crying wolf and this idea of you know well in the first few weeks we didn't know but now we're learning many of those who who were in the position of power actually did know they were familiar enough with this to know and now it's, I think, a matter of, well, they don't know. It, it's a mix, I think, of, uh, I, I believe, of some people saying, well, they don't know what they're doing. They don't really know. And we're being lied to. And I think it either way, you can't trust it. Well, Fauci on the masks last week. Yeah. Right. The gobbledygook that he had on that one was like, dude, you need to shut up. Well, <laughs> seriously, it's, be- look, it's it was I, it was clear for a lot of people that they were they were kind of testing the waters to see if they could bring back a mask mandate. The left really wanted to. They would love to bring back a mask mandate, but politically, you're not going to get away with it now. You're just not. And, you know, Newsom, we've talked about his blue bubble he lives in in California. You step outside of that if he ever runs for president, and he's going to learn very quickly what people really think of him. But I think you saw probably enough backlash by even those rank-and-file Democrats in his state. You're saying, I can't go anywhere. I can't get close to people. One of the first photos to come out is him sitting at a table with doctors. No masks. Well, you saw the uh, the CNN interview that he did last week where they actually cited the uh, Cochrane Review study mm-hmm. published in January mm-hmm. of 78 high-quality scientific studies uh, with more than 610,000 participants that concluded masks were useless in stopping the transmission yep. of the virus, including the the high-quality masks. Right. I can't think of the name of them. What were they called? The N95? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. There is just no evidence masks make any difference. Full stop. The lead author... Oxford University epidemiologist Thomas Jefferson said at the time. So after reading Fauci, some of the conclusions of the study, Fauci was asked, how do we get beyond that finding of that particular review? He was caught by surprise and (laughs) I love this here and vomited out an answer of sorts. Yeah, but there are other studies 
that show an individual that at an individual level for an individual, you're talking about the effect of the epidemic or a pandemic as a whole. The data is less strong. But when you talk about uh, as an individual basis of someone protecting themselves or protecting themselves from spreading it to others, there's no doubt there are many studies that show that there is an advantage. Huh? Where? It doesn't help it as a whole, but it helps as an individual. <laughs> How? I think what he wanted to actually say is if a person chooses that they want to wear a mask, which is which I don't care what you wear on your face. But Fauci is the guy that led the entire drive for the mask mandate and push for it repeatedly. And now basically, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of um, of uh, Barney Frank after the housing debacle. Well, I always thought that people should not buy a house. They should live in apartments. What a liar. This sounds like, because I think Fauci wanted to go with, Oh, no, I, th- I think it should be an individual choice. Oh. He, it sounded like he was edging closer and closer to that. And the fact of the matter is, no, for him, it was all about that power. It was all about having the mandate in place. And it was never about the individual. Well, I, I, and, and so they, uh, New York Post uh, 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 pointed out the fact that the media went back to Dr. Jefferson himself. Mm that was lead author of the study that said masks don't do anything. Right. Even the good ones don't do anything. Right. And (laughs) because they write here in the New York Post, it's not just us saying that. It's what Jefferson himself said when he weighed in this week on Fauci's CNN disinformation dump. Quote, so Fauci is saying that masks work for individuals, but not at a population level. That simply doesn't make any sense. Jefferson told independent journalist Marianne DeMossi. He says there are other studies, but what studies? This is what Dr. Jefferson is saying. Jefferson suggested the former White House advisor might be relying on trash studies. Many of them are observational. Some are cross-sectional and and some actually use modeling. That is not strong evidence. He said Fauci doesn't understand the cloth and surgical masks cannot stop viruses because viruses are too small and they still get through. What I do know is that Fauci was in a position to run a trial. He could have randomized two regions to wear masks or not, but he didn't. And that's unforgivable, said Jefferson. Wow. Wow. Yeah, uh, you look at it, and the only thing that still stands out, the only thing that you could look at as truths that still stand from the very beginning is if you have you are elderly with underlying conditions right. and, obese, and, and also obesity, mm-hmm. you've got problems with COVID. Yep. We know that. But if you don't, if you're younger and don't have underlying conditions and aren't obese, less than the flu. Well, and, you know, it's there are anomalies. My uh, daughter that contracted it, and it's skinny as a rail. I'm always wanting to take her out to eat. Come on, gain a little weight. Um, and she doesn't have any underlying conditions. But it it doesn't. Here's the thing. It doesn't mean you're. Your uh, immunity isn't compromised for whatever reason. You, know, you could be going through something else. Stress can compromise your immunity. Right, exactly. But right, it, but right. that's the anomaly. <clears throat> right. That's not the general. Generally speaking, it's exactly what we said it was from the beginning. And you would be shut out. Uh, you would be, in fact, shut down officially on social media if you were to say, Behave like it's the flu. We know how to we know how to mitigate viruses and the effect of such. We know. My elderly parents still do the same thing. 
every flu season. They have the same practice in place. They watch the reports on their, you know, uh, locally to see how bad the flu situation is. They know if they can, if they should venture out or not. And we calculate, we take these risks on a calculated level every single day and have been for a long, long time. But the research that came out last week that was announced, early research data has shown that antibodies produced by prior infection or existing vaccines against the coronavirus were sufficient to protect against the new BA286 variant. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control said on Friday the Food and Drug Administration in the coming days is expected to authorize the updated vaccines that target the subvariant of Omicron and early data providing encouraging signs for the new shot, CDC said. The public health agency added that the new BA286 lineage of coronavirus was not driving the current increases in COVID cases and hospitalizations in the United States, but was rather attributed to other predominantly circulating viruses. So there you go. And so, I mean, how much hype are you going to hear on it now? Now, you did see what was it, the Florida uh, Surgeon General Mm. said, don't take the new saw that don't take the new shot hmm. yeah hasn't been enough human trials on it right well and again, that's and that's where you get to the point now of it's like you can't the cdc because of fauci yeah even when they write an article like this mm-hmm. where it says uh uh no the uh you know the your current antibodies work when you cry wolf when you can't trust anybody when do you know how to trust them? And when it's the government consistently lying to you up to the fact of Fauci still defending masks the way he is. Yeah, right. Without any type of explanation, just I've said it, therefore it must be true. Well, and, and the most dangerous part is if there were ever, you know, out, outside of COVID, another virus that were to come out that were dangerous. and they couldn't get people's attention because they can't gain their trust. That becomes especially dangerous, but it's too late for that. They told a series of lies over and over again. They're still behaving in the same way. And this is why you don't do that. 866-90 red eye. Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Eric, you see where researchers believe they may have found one of the world's largest deposits of lithium on the yeah. Nevada-Oregon border? Mm-hmm. Sorry, you can't go get it. <laughs> That's the whole point. doesn't matter how, how much is in there. The environmentalists don't want lithium, which means they don't want electric vehicles. Right. I mean, it's pure insanity what net, we're going through Net right now. zero is not zero. Right. Stop taking from the planet. Stop <laughs> mining. Stop mining. Stop mining. By the way, I saw the protesters, one of the Walmart, one of the heirs to the Walmart fortune, the protesters that believe in it, and they have a, a sign, billionaires shouldn't exist. <laughs> so they spray painted <laughs> some red paint, spray paint on her yacht. Oh, no. <laughs> That'll stop her. <laughs> if only there was a way to remove spray paint from my yacht. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One.